Are you feeling good? Are you feeling like you sprang forward this morning into a whole new season? I can see it on your faces. You're pumped. You're excited. We're just really, really glad that you're here. Today, as we continue in this Turning Point series, we're in John's Gospel, chapter 4. So if you have a copy of the Bible with you or on your device, feel free to find that. We're going to be looking at some verses there in just a moment. Several years ago, I uh, had a dinner conversation with Dr. Robert Coleman. I don't know if the name means anything to you, but in a previous generation, Dr. Bob Coleman was one of the most respected gurus in the world uh, when it came to evangelism, discipleship, and church growth. He wrote a book called The Master Plan of Evangelism, which was a bestseller. And he wrote other books on discipleship and church growth and leadership that were standard books in many seminaries around the world. You can imagine growing up revering him as a hero of the faith. I was kind of awestruck and honored when he asked me to join him for dinner. You see, we had arrived, checked in the hotel. We were both scheduled to speak the next day to several hundred pastors who had gathered at a school of evangelism. And so over our dinner conversation, Dr. Coleman made a statement that I have never forgotten. He said, Rex, I'm amazed that we don't really look more to Jesus as our model for sharing the good news. He said, don't get me wrong, it, it, it's fine to take some cues from the Apostle Paul, from the Apostle Peter, and other writers of the New Testament, but he said, it just strikes me as strange that we don't really look to Jesus as Christ followers. We don't look to Jesus as our primary model for how to share the good news. And I've never, ever forgotten that. And I think he's right. Jesus really is our primary model. And because that is true, we are going to learn a lot, both today and next week, as we study a conversation Jesus had. It's the longest one he had, by the way, as recorded in any of the four Gospels, and it's found in John 4 as he talked with a woman at a lonely well in Samaria. So let's dive in now. I think there's so many things we can learn from this story. The first one is that all kinds of people need God. Now, if you were with us last week, you know we talked about Nicodemus. But think about some of the incredible differences between Nicodemus and this woman that we're talking about today. First of all, he was a Jew and she was a Samaritan. And in that day, there was intense animosity between the two groups. In fact, we're going to see later in verse 9, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Now, why was that? That tension went back a thousand years in their history. Because a thousand years earlier, roughly, in this northern section of Israel, the Assyrians had overtaken them and had scattered the people. And so foreigners came in from all over the world, not just Assyrians, but from other nations, and they had settled in this northern area of Palestine and intermarried with the Jewish people who were still there. And so to faithful Jews in the south, they saw the Samaritans as half-breeds. They weren't really true Jewish people. Secondly, they had different worship places and practices. Obviously, faithful Jews worship God in the temple in Jerusalem. But the Samaritans had the gall to go ahead and build another temple where they worshiped God, and it was up on Mount Gerizim. And they boasted, now, if you really want an encounter with God, you need to be on Mount Gerizim. That's where God got the dust to make Adam, after all. That was a local saying they had. And if you really want true worship, it happens up on Mount Gerizim. Next, he was a male, she was a female. You may think, well, what's the big deal about that? In our era of so much liberation and focus on equality, I think it's hard for us to imagine today the extreme prejudice that existed against women in this culture. 
Some of you may have seen that old movie, Yentl, starring Barbara Streisand, where she, as a young Jewish girl, wants to get a formal education, but she can't because she's female. And so she literally dresses up and masquerades as a young man so that she can go to school. But it wasn't just educational opportunities that were denied to women. Some Jewish rabbis insisted that Jewish men should not even have a conversation in public with a woman, not even his wife or sister. So in the minds of many, women were second-class citizens who had very few rights. But think about how different Jesus treated women. He gave this woman dignity and courtesy and respect. He requested of her a drink of water. Occasionally, I'll hear uninformed people today suggest that Christianity is repressive to women. Folks, nothing could be further from the truth. Check it out. Anywhere Christianity has gone on this planet, it has always raised the status of women, and Jesus is responsible for that. He did something revolutionary in his day. He treated women with respect, not as second-class citizens. Another difference is that Nicodemus was what you might call an up-and-outer, where she was a down-and-outer. You just don't get more respected or connected than Nicodemus. As we saw last week, he was a part of the in crowd, the intelligentsia. He had all the right network, had gone to all the right schools, and this woman, by contrast, had none of that. She felt lonely and ostracized. She was not only estranged from her prior husbands, but she was even alienated from the women, apparently, in this community. Most women in that day, this was usually a chore that the women did, they would go early in the morning and or late in the evening to draw water because it wasn't as hot. This woman is coming at noontime when the sun is near its most intense, and she was coming alone. When women did that, they always went in groups for two reasons. One was for safety, and the other was just to have some fellowship and conversation. Obviously, this woman was an outcast. But another significant difference is that Nicodemus, we saw last week, was wealthy, and this woman is probably poor. You see, members of the Sanhedrin were almost always well off financially. This woman, by contrast, was probably far from rich. She still had this chore of daily going and getting water. My guess is she was barely getting by. So what's the bottom line? When you boil it all down, it's hard to imagine two individuals more different than Nicodemus and the woman that we're looking at today. But here's one thing, one thing they had in common. In spite of all their other differences, they both desperately needed a relationship with the living God. And friends, as we encounter people today, I want to tell you, you're going to meet up and outers and down and outers. You're going to be rich and poor, formally educated and formally uneducated. You're going to meet people from every kind of ethnicity and origin in life. But here's the thing we must understand. We all need a relationship with God. Even pastor's kids need a relationship with God. Amen? I want you to turn your attention to the screens now as we hear from our own Half Moon campus pastor, Tim Gardner, who was a pastor's kid, as he shares his turning point story. Let's listen together. My dad's a pastor, and so I grew up in a Christian home my entire life. I went to church on Sunday morning. I went to church on Wednesday night. I would walk home from school to church because it was closer to the school than my house. So I was always there, and I was known as the pastor's kid. When I was six years old, I decided that I wanted to accept 
Jesus into my heart. And so I went into my parents' bathroom where my mom was getting ready for work. And I said, hey, mom, I want to accept Jesus. And she was ecstatic and surprised and so ready to lead me in a prayer to accept Jesus into my life. But nothing really changed. I didn't feel that any different. I didn't do anything different. I was still the pastor's kid. And as a pastor's kid, you're kind of in the light. You are seen by everyone and everyone expects you to be perfect. And so I lived into that. I was perfect on the outside. I did everything right. But growing up through middle school, high school, really there was no difference between Tim before Christ and Tim after Christ. I lived the same, I got into the same things, the things that typically teenagers get into, I got into them. And it wasn't until my junior year of high school where I got a new youth pastor named Chris and he met with me and he talked with me and he saw me as I really was, not as the pastor's kid who's perfect, but as Tim, who is a sinner, flawed, and has issues. Because of that relationship, I was able to be myself, and I was able to ask questions, and I was able to lean into the doubt that I had about Christianity, about my relationship with Jesus, and I consider that my turning point. That relationship with Chris, my youth pastor, and with other people in that community, them seeing who I really was, and me being able to kind of let the guard down and, and not be perfect. And those relationships helped me become a true Christ follower. It hasn't been perfect ever since. It's not this upward slope line where I always get better and better and better at being a disciple of Jesus. There's highs on mountaintop highs and there's lows in, in deep, deep valley lows. Um, but my turning point was in relationship that let me express doubt, ask questions, and be real. Amen. Good job. All kinds of people need God. But a second observation I would suggest here is that we often have to get out of our routine and comfort zone to reach people. Now, if you've been in church much or heard this passage mentioned, you know that Jewish people tried to avoid Samaritan people and vice versa like the plague. In fact, people traveling from Jerusalem may be going north toward Galilee, even though Samaria was right in the middle and that was the straightest shot from Jerusalem to Galilee, Jewish people wouldn't do that. Instead, they went several miles out of their way, took additional time, crossed over the Jordan River twice in order to avoid being, quote, contaminated by these despised Samaritans. Now, imagine this. In our locality, here's what that would look like. Let's suppose, just for the sake of the illustration, that people from Water Valley are like Samaritans. They're despised, outcast, looked down on, that kind of thing, okay? Let's suppose someone wanted to go from Albany up to Cohoes. Here's what that would look like. Instead of going on a straight shot right through Water Valley, which would be the easiest and the closest, in order to avoid the cannoneers altogether, those despised people from Water Valley, what they would do is cross over the Hudson River east at the Patroon Island Bridge, go all the way up the east side of the Hudson so as not to breathe any air that the Water Valley people were breathing. They'd go all the way up to Troy, cross back over west over the Collar City Bridge into Green Island and straight on into Cohoes. As ridiculous as that sounds to us, that's exactly the way they lived then. But then you get this strange statement in verse 4. Talking about Jesus, it says, now he had to go through Samaria. No, he didn't. He didn't have to. Lots of people did. Most people didn't. There were other roads to take, believe me. This was not a geographical necessity. It was a divine imperative. Jesus, I think, wanted to demonstrate powerfully that God does not show favoritism. It doesn't matter your place of origin, your family background, your ethnicity, what you've done. God has no favorites. I think he was making a statement here against prejudice and pride. 
He was willing to open himself up to criticism and misunderstanding in order to reach people with the good news. Now, I believe for you and me, it's going to be the same. What would God need to do to get you out of your comfort zone? What would that look like for you? For some of you, it might mean walking across your street and engaging a neighbor. For others, it might be talking to someone in the cubicle, in that fishbowl of an office where you go every day, but maybe you've never really gotten to know that person. For others of you, it might mean that God would nudge you by his spirit to get to know someone who's very, very different than you. But God's saying, I want you to meet this person. I want you to talk to them and get to know them. Trust me, in my experience, evangelism and sharing Christ never seems to be convenient. There always seems to be something else going on, something that's pressing. There needs to be a better place, a better time. But Jesus got out of his mold. He intentionally worked to break down barriers. And I think God's going to want us to do the same. So all kinds of people need to know God. We've got to get out of our comfort zone to reach them. But a third thing is we must understand how little people in our modern culture actually know about God. Biblical literacy is at an all-time low. And here's why that greatly concerns me, and I hope it greatly concerns you. Because the primary way that people are going to get a clear picture of who God really is and what this good news is really about is through the revelation of God he's given us in his written word and in the living word, our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5 reads, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour, that's 12 noon, so right in the middle of the day. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. Now, I believe that this dear woman was shocked when Jesus spoke to her. Because again, this is something that just didn't happen. The Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And then John, the human author of this, makes this parenthetical statement here, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. He's throwing that in, by the way, for all the people who who might be reading this but don't understand all of these cultural dynamics. And again, as I said earlier, what follows here is the longest conversation recorded in all four Gospels that Jesus ever had with any individual. There's so much we can learn from this. So for the balance of our time, and by the way, we're going to pick this up again next week because this is such a rich passage. I don't want us to miss any of it. But for the balance of our time today, I want to focus on some of the things that this woman did not know that she really needed to know. And by the way, people today are usually oblivious about these same things, and we really need to know them. The first thing she didn't know is she didn't know the gift of God, the gift of God. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living Water. Now, what in the world is the gift of God? If you've read the Bible, you know it says a lot about gifts, what we call spiritual gifts and how they work. A lot in there about that. But there's only one thing in Scripture that is referred to as the gift of God. You can read about it in Romans 6.23, where it says, For the wages of sin is death, but here it is, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And yet there's so much confusion about eternal life. For instance, there's confusion about what it actually is. 
I believe most people today believe that eternal life is something you get when you die. But that is not true. Look at John 3.36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. In the Greek text, has eternal life is in the present tense. In other words, it's a reality to right now. It's not something you get later. It's going on right now. How about this verse, John 5, 24? I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has, again, present tense, eternal life, and will not be condemned. He has, right now, present tense, crossed over from death to life. Now, why am I stressing this? Because if you take a walk through some cemeteries in our area, here's what you will see over and over again. It's just a common thing on tombstones. So-and-so, and it has their name, entered into eternal life, and then it gives the date that they died. It says that's when they entered into eternal life. But eternal life in the New Testament is not something you get when you die. It's something you receive from God as a gift, present tense. It starts now, but yes, it does continue through all eternity. Now, I don't want to see any raids on cemeteries going on, all right? Don't take your chisel and your hammer and go, oh my goodness, I have the relative out there that has that. No, go change in it. But just be aware, eternal life starts now. But there's also confusion about why do we need it? Why do we need eternal life? Well, the reason is because the alternative is perishing. Those are the only two alternatives. Last week, we saw an example of how those two are placed in juxtaposition with each other. John 3, 16, here it is again. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but now here's the alternative to perishing, have eternal life. In the New Testament, by the way, perishing is by definition a process. It doesn't happen on one day. It's a process. Debbie and I will go to the grocery store and buy vegetables, Oh, they look so great. They look so fresh and new and wonderful, and we look forward to sauteing them or steaming them and putting them with some other things and making a meal out of them. But you know what happens? If you don't use them quickly enough, what happens? They perish. They perish. In fact, when we bought them and they looked so great, guess what? They were already in the process of perishing. When you buy them, you just hope they aren't too far along in the process so you've at least got a little bit of time before you have to use them. Otherwise, they become rancid and rotten and you have to throw them out. They perish. And eternal life, this saving life of God, is something that he gives us that halts the process of perishing. For instance, 1 Corinthians 1. (coughs) It says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Not those who will perish one day, but who are perishing. Again, it's present tense. But to us who are being saved, again, present tense, it is the power of God. One more verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Present tense again, it's a process. Now, I'll not burden you with any or more verses, although we could. We could go on and on and on showing you that eternal life is not something that happens out there. It's right now. And perishing is not something that happens out there. It's already going on. Every one of us is naturally in the process of perishing unless the gospel of Jesus Christ has been introduced, unless God has intervened in a person's life, halting the process of perishing and replacing it with a process of living. That's why we need the gift of God, which is eternal life. There is no third option. It's like, ooh, no third option? 
Pastor, that's awfully narrow. Yes, it is. In fact, it's so narrow and offensive, I would never make something up like that. I got it straight from Jesus. I'm just sharing it with you. Jesus was crystal clear in his communication. He said, there's two options here, folks. You're either on the broad road of destruction or you're on the narrow road of eternal life. Which road are you on today? Because there's so much confusion, not only about what eternal life is, there's confusion about why we need it, but there is incredible confusion also in our culture about how you get it. How do you get eternal life? Well, remember, it's a gift from God. Now, when you're gonna receive a gift, what do you usually do? I don't know about you, but I just, I just kind of reach out an empty hand and with a grateful heart, I receive it and I say, thank you so much. And by the way, if it's a real gift, you don't earn it, do you? No. And there's not even one shred of evidence in the Bible that suggests for a moment that we are earning this gift of eternal life. In fact, that is offensive to God to think that you could pay God back for it. That language is never used in the Bible. All that's required is a humble heart that receives it with humility and says, thank you, God. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus today, I hope you're really zeroed in right now because we live in a culture where just like this dear woman had a lack of understanding about these things, people in our culture have a huge lack of understanding about these things. But that leads us to a second thing she didn't know. She didn't know who Jesus was. Verse 10 again. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that ask you for a drink. But she didn't know. As far as she was concerned, he was just a stranger sitting beside the well. And friends, I want to tell you, hundreds of thousands of people awakened in the Capital District this morning, and 90 or more percent of them never had for one moment it crossed their mind, hey, it's Sunday. I ought to go to worship God today. Never crossed their mind. You know why? Because they don't know who Jesus is. Now, they may have used his name as an expletive. They may have heard about him in a world religions class. They may, if asked, even say, oh, he was a really cool dude. He walked among the lilies, and he was kind to people, and uh, he was way ahead of his time. Let me, I think Jesus is really, really cool. I'll tell you that. But they don't, they don't have a clue who he really is. Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Now remember, different as they were, the Jews and Samaritans shared a common heritage. They both looked back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as their forefathers. And so Jacob was literally the patriarch who dug this well in the beginning and then passed it on to his son Joseph. And so she's kind of challenging Jesus here, going, are you, what are you saying? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Now, he didn't answer her question, but if he had answered it honestly, he would have probably said, yeah, actually I am. That's why I'm offering you something more than what Jacob gave you here with this well. I'm offering you something way beyond that, living water. Now, I say to you respectfully, if you are on a search today, maybe checking out Christianity, I would humbly suggest to you that it will never make real sense, real sense to you until you understand who Jesus Christ really is. 
If you're here today, I'm so glad you're here if you're on a search, but if you believe that Christianity is just a psychological rubric that's hopefully going to help you have a little more hope for the future, or if you believe that Christianity, hey, you say, I've checked out all the world religion, and as far as I can tell, Christianity just has a superior ethical system, and that's why I'm interested in it. Or if you're here today and you're saying, you know what, I have heard that Christianity can really help you have a better life financially, and so I want to check that part out. Listen, I am so glad you're here, but you will never really understand the essence of Christianity unless you understand who Jesus is, and that will only happen if the Holy Spirit reveals that to you. So you're in a good place. And I hope with humble, open heart, you're ready to receive the truth that Jesus is not just another God competing in the pantheon of possible gods out there that's calling for your allegiance. The Bible teaches that he is the unique God-man who alone can save. Wow, is that audacious or what? Yeah, that's the, that's the deal. That's what scripture teaches Verse 13, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Now let's pause there for a moment. Something very important I believe we need to acknowledge. As far as we can tell, up to this point, later she's gonna have a different understanding, but up to this point, I think she's thinking totally on a material level. Here's what I think this dear woman is thinking. Look, my life is hard. I don't have a lot going for me right now. Honestly, it's been a tough journey. And one of the things I really detest is that every day I have to make the long journey out here, usually all alone, in the heat of the day, and I have to draw water. Listen, man, I'm a little skeptical, but if you've got some trick here to change all this, make my life better, a little happier, a little easier, hey, I'm listening. If you've got some therapy, if you've got some newfangled gadget, if you've got some new technology, if you've got something I've never heard of before that'll make my life easier, I'm all in. But if not, I'm not interested. Have you ever talked to anybody like that? You know, I have. I've had a lot of conversations about faith with people. And here's what I've often encountered. This is me. I don't know if you've ever encountered this. A lot of people are like this. Look, if God can fix my marriage, I'm interested. Look, if God can turn this situation around, then hey, I'm, I'm wide open to that. Hey, listen, if God can heal this physical problem I've got, then I'm very interested. But if not, I have no interest in Christianity and what you're talking about. That's where so many people are today. Now, here's the, here's the challenge for true Christians at this point. When someone gives that vibe, when someone makes it clear that's where they are, we are tempted, tempted, as Christians, to shift the focus of the gospel onto some side benefit that they really need. We're tempted to go down the road and say, hey, here are all the material benefits of Christianity. Here's all the psychological benefits of Christianity. But when we do that, it devalues the gospel. Now, I'm gonna come back to that in just a moment, so keep that thought. We'll be back in just a moment to that point. Verse 16, he told her, go call your husband and come back. Now, Jesus is focusing here on a sensitive, I think, a sensitive area in her life. She might have been a little bit embarrassed. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you know, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband, What you've just said is quite true. Now here, she discovers a third thing that she did not know. She didn't know how much he knew about her, but wow, did he know a lot. In fact, he knew everything. Can you believe this? Jesus knew her history. 
He knew all about the broken marriages she'd been through. She, he knew all of her heartaches and all the insecurity and anxiety she was now experiencing living with this guy that she wasn't married to, not knowing if he was really into her or really committed to her or not and what would happen if she found out he wasn't. He knows everything about her. And you know what? He knows everything about you and me. But here's the shocker. Even though he knows everything about you and me, he still loves us unconditionally. Wow. The writer of Hebrews puts it like this. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. In other words, we don't keep any secrets from God. He knows everything there's a saying in recovery circles, you're only as sick as your secrets. Good news. You don't even have any secrets with God. He knows all about you. He loves you just as you are. Everything is uncovered and laid bare. And friends, there comes a moment in our life when we have to face the issue of our problem, and our main problem is sin. Jesus came to save us from our sins. Now, please, please, please don't misunderstand me today. There's lots of other side benefits to the gospel. Go with me here. For instance, there are material benefits to the gospel. I'm absolutely convinced of that. By the way, everywhere Christianity has been embraced by a culture, there's been an economic lift in that culture. And I've seen this over and over again in personal lives where people get their relationship with God sorted out, not in every single case, but in most cases it leads to some more prospering in their material financial life. One of the main reasons for that is they start living more responsibly. If they truly embrace the values of Christ, they're going to have a value of being good stewards of what God has entrusted to them, and that leads naturally to an economic lift. Can I tell you what's more? There are definitely physical health benefits to the gospel. I'm going to go on record today as saying that I believe that faithful followers of Christ are generally speaking, not in every single case, but generally speaking, healthier than unbelievers. Why? Because they understand their body's the temple of the Holy Spirit, and they want to be good stewards of that, right? And I want to go on record today as saying that I believe there are side benefits of morality and ethics in the gospel. I'll tell you, you can search the Capital District and some of the finest people you will meet, will meet are gonna be people of faith, followers of Jesus. I mean, go check it out. Who's leading most of the humanitarian efforts? Who's serving in the places that are feeding the homeless and the hungry and helping people who are down and out and hurt? It's almost entirely people of faith. Go to any of our serving days where we descend by hundreds to some community around here and without anything in return, we just serve the underserved people there. Who does that? I've not met a single atheist yet at one of those events. Now, if you're an atheist today, God bless you or your higher power bless you or just bless you. I'm glad you're here. I'd love to have a conversation with you. All I'm saying is I've not met a single atheist at one of those serving events. There is definitely a side benefit of morality to the gospel. And there's definitely psychological benefits. Those of us who follow Christ know that life can be falling apart all around you, but he gives you an amazing peace that passes understanding on the inside. But are you still listening to me? While all of those benefits are very, very real, that's not primarily what the gospel is about. That's not primarily what the gospel is about. That's not primarily what the gospel is about. So don't make it about those things. The gospel is primarily about Jesus coming and dealing with our real issue, which is sin. All those other things are just symptoms. 
And if you're not careful, and if you don't get what I'm saying to you right now, I fear that you're going to spend the rest of your life knocking down cobwebs when all the time God wants to kill the spider that is causing all of these issues in your life. Jesus came to save us from our sins. Now, we're going to pick right up there next week. I don't want you to miss a bit of this. It gets more exciting as we go as she begins to put the pieces together and Jesus reveals who he really is. But I want to close today with this question. Where do you stand with God? I hope, oh, I hope that you've not gotten the message somewhere that the real point of the gospel is that Jesus came just to make you a little wealthier, a little healthier, and a little happier. If that's the message you got, I'm sorry. Those are just side benefits. Jesus came because apart from the saving life of God, all of us are perishing, all of us. And it's only when he intervenes into that life that's perishing and brings his eternal life, he stops the process of perishing and he replaces it with his very life in us. That's what I want for you. I hope you get all the other side benefits too, but if you don't get that, you missed it. You missed it completely. So if you're here today and you don't know that you've ever met God in that kind of way, oh, please don't leave here without having a conversation. Right around this corner, there are men and women who are amazing. I promise you they won't be preachy. I promise you they won't, they, they won't be condescending. They're amazing. They're so kind, and they'll just have an open dialogue with you about where you are in your journey. They'd love to do that. Talk to the leaders out in the lobby don't get away from here today without exploring what this eternal life really means. Father, thank you for your love and thank you for this powerful conversation that Jesus had at a lonely well in Samaria. May we learn from Jesus, our main primary model about how to share the good news. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. <laughs> 